This episode is brought to you by Helium Mobile. They've created a crypto native phone plan for unlimited talk, text, and data for just $20 a month. We'll chat more about them later in the show. Before we get moving on today's episode, just a quick disclaimer. The views expressed on this podcast by either myself, my co-host, or any guests are their personal views and do not represent the views of any associated organization. Nothing in the episode should be construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or any other advice. Okay, let's jump into the episode. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Lightspeed. we got a Merton Daniel roundup today. So we're recording on April 11th. Uh, so we'll give you the latest happenings uh, in the week thus far. I uh, got a lot of dis- lot to discuss. It's been a busy week. It does feel like uh, one of those bull market week- weeks where 73 different things happened and they're all extremely relevant. Um, so it's one of the times we're building out that the pod schedule is like, all right, which ones do we pick? But um, good jumping off point, Mert, is probably... You know, we've been talking a lot about what's broken with Solana, what needs to be fixed and the direction it's going. But one thing we've kind of haven't touched on is, okay, well, well, what are the fixes actually coming uh, to market? And uh, the timeline question is always a tough one, especially for the engineering folk, right? Like, you don't want to overpromise a date on on delivery on these things. But uh, do you have any ETAs on on what that is? So I guess two part question one, like, what are the fixes that are going to come first? uh, And what are they actually fixing? And then rough ballpark timeline. Yeah, so the tricky situation here is there's actually multiple parts to the fix or to the patches. I, I want to emphasize that it's not like a fix in the sense that once something is released, everything is now magically d- different. Uh, I think it'll be a bit more gradual than like a zero to one step. And based on what, uh, so maybe some context is. A few days ago, I was des- describing the problem on Twitter, and I basically described it as this is an implementation error, not a design error. And the reason those things are different is because a design error is very fundamental, right? Like if you design something wrong, you have to start basically over again. You can't really change the design, right? Um, that's kind of what happened with Ethereum, right? They had to transition from being this chain that where you know they went through multiple phases and then ultimately ended up in this roll-up centric roadmap, that took many, many years, right? If Solana had kind of the similar, let's say, flaw, it would also take it many, many years or probably somewhat faster than Ethereum, but still. This issue, though, is an implementation error. And what, what I mean by that is, just to catch everybody back up, uh, Solana uses this protocol called Quick, and it's a networking protocol which is to say that it's the thing that controls how packets on the internet are sent from machine to machine. Okay, so when I send a transaction um, from my computer to the next Solana block leader, it goes through a physical networking layer, right? Like literal cables. And there's software that determines how that stuff behaves. And in this case, Solana has something called the quick networking protocol, Um, but that's the protocol. And then for Rust specifically, there's an implementation of that protocol in Rust called Quinn. It's an open source repository, it's an open source library. And basically it kind of dies when uh, traffic gets too hot. Like when it, And I think from what I understand, the engineers at Labs or Anza now knew this. And they basically said that we probably won't get to that load for a while. So we'll come back to fix it, which is like tech debt. So it was kind of known. Uh, But then the demand with meme coins and like these ridiculous like networking spam issues uh, kind of happened faster than people thought. And so now what needs to happen is that library that I said, Quinn, needs to get some changes to it so that it can handle this extra traffic. I presume that after that, like after the bleeding is stopped, they'll actually probably rewrite the library altogether or use a different library. Um, but currently the quick fix is just going to be fixing that library. Um, and obviously it's, it's, it's a big undertaking. There's more than one bug, which is to say there's like a, a, a sequence of bugs to be fixed. Maybe there's like four patches or something. Um, the first immediate one that I saw from Rex and Rex is the head of DevRel developer relations at Anza now. Um, so you should probably follow him for official information. He uh, he said there's a new patch that might actually roll out in 
which is 1.17 is the current version of Solana. Uh, so that might actually be before the 15th of April. So this might be any day now. We might actually get this new patch. And for example, by the time this podcast episode is released, and that uh, he said that that one is supposed to help with stake weight QoS. And what stake weight QoS means is, by the way, QoS stands for quality of service. It basically means that when you're talking to these block leaders, right, like there's a validator that's responsible for producing the current block in the Solana blockchain, um, everybody can make a connection to it and send transactions to it. But the ones that have stake will get prioritized first or they'll have a more pers persistent connection. Um, and that today actually doesn't really work as advertised. There's some bugs with it. Like you can have 2 million in stake and your transactions uh, still won't be as effective as they should be. Uh, and so now with this patch, I think the idea is that uh, RPCs or whoever runs a node or whoever forwards transactions that have access to a staked connection, their send transactions will be more effective than ones who don't do that. So public connections. Um, so that's the patch. And obviously, there's going to be some period where people still need to move over to these staked connections and people need to gather, gather stake. And there's probably going to be some migration period there that's going to be non-trivial, probably a few days, I would say, maybe weeks. Um, Helios, for example, we already have a bunch of these and we have a staked network connection. So people who use us um, will benefit from this pretty uh, instantly, I would say. Um, and then we're also spinning up our own validator, etc. So that's a very high level idea now it is contentious i from what i understand um because you know now you you're bringing in the question like hey is the network now only for people who have stake who can land these transactions right is this the end game so that's an interesting question um i don't think that's actually how it will play out because that's not what the market wants and ultimately you need to satisfy the market um i think at first it'll probably be a bit closer to that than i would like um, but I don't think that's a permanent thing. Like once the networking protocol is fixed, once economic incentives are added to deter spam, then maybe QoS will have a different role to play. Um, and the other side of this, which might be interesting is that now as a team building on Solana, you're actually much more incentivized to run your own validator, right? Because the validator now has a direct connection to your ability to land transactions in some sense. So let's say you're a very, uh, for for example, like a borrow land protocol, like a, like a, like a soul land. If you're running these liquidators, um, li liquidation bots, you really want like very, very strict guarantees, like nine fives of guarantees or something to actually land these transactions. Maybe the way to do that is you run your own node with stake, right? So that's an interesting incentive. Um, that's, I, I try to kind of just paint a picture there without getting too opinionated because I think it is hard to predict how this will play out. It's an interesting experiment. Um, I think some people, like for example, Lucas from Gito doesn't like the QoS for the end game solution too much, I believe, whereas Tolly does. Uh, and then some people kind of, people fall on either side of this camp. So, um, and then after that is gonna be maybe uh, a few more patches that are coming potentially with 1.18 and releasing on April 15th. But obviously in engineering, um, depending on how long the testing goes, it might be a few days later, a few weeks later. It really depends on what they find in testing, right? If there's like a catastrophic bug, then it doesn't make sense to release it at that point. If testing is fine, then hopefully we can release it ASAP. Perfect. So there's a lot to unpack there. I want to rewind to the, the to the first piece, but the, the QoS stuff I think might be even more interesting. Uh, but when you were talking about... The Onza team, you know, they're, they're building their own client now, uh, separate from labs, and you'll have the Onza client, and then you eventually will have Fire Dancer, uh, and then Jito kind of builds on top of, of the existing client to add their block engine, right? And so when you think about client diversity, if supposedly the, you know, Jump Jump has rebuilt the networking stack for their new client, uh, you know, not supposedly, that's, that's true. And I don't think that this is, this is the supposedly part, right? Like they're not going to, have a lot of the issues we're seeing today in this new networking stack. And so if you're Anza and you're like, okay, you know, we implemented Quinn today. It's not great. We could put some patches on it, but it's probably not our long-term solution. Would you 
be interested in like just basically taking the the jump networking stack since it you know doesn't face these problems, or would you want to rebuild something you know entirely separate so you do truly have two separate clients that you could run that don't have any overlapping pieces of code? Like I'm I'm curious from a client diversity standpoint, like what makes more sense in your mind? I I think client diversity is a very interesting topic that I feel has almost been politicized maybe even like DEI'd in, in a sense, like you must have these like inclusion of the clients. Um, I mean, I don't have any strong opinions on this, but you know, maybe my first shot of it is I'd rather the client that's by far like the most efficient for the network be the primary client. And then if um, the concern is liveness, have a backup running for failovers and just have that mechanism iron out a bit more. But I don't see the point of something being 50% this, 50% that, um, or like, so, like I, I, I personally don't like that. Um, I, that's probably a hot take, I guess. But um, now, okay, the question is, can Anza take what um, Fire Dancer was implemented and then put it in their stack? Uh, and it's like, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure how, I haven't taken a look at the code itself. Obviously, one is in C and one is in Rust. Mm. And so you, it's not going to be like, that easy to do, right? Uh, I don't know, maybe with chat GPT these days, but um, I think the interface, as long as that's clear, which I think the spec is being worked out anyways as the client process gets rebuilt. Um, but I think, you know, they could also rebuild it in something in Rust as well. Um, so I'm not sure what they're going to do, but I'm fairly certain that the approach is going to be patches first to stop the bleeding and then uh, maybe look at a rewrite. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, I know Ethereum, the, the Ethereum community definitely prioritizes this client diversity notion. But uh, if you have one client that is significantly more performant than the others, you know, it does kind of leave you with the feeling that like, hey, why wouldn't we all run this much better client? Um, which is what it seems like Fire Dancer will be. Of course, it's still in in the process of being built. But uh I think it's a paradigm team is actually building Reth or they're rebuilding the Geth client for Ethereum in Rust. Um, and it'll be interesting when that hits hits the market because that's going to be much more performant. I've seen, I think they've been pushing some of the early testing numbers. Uh, I know they're working with the base team as well, uh, trying to get that client up and running on the OP stack so they can kind of help help juice the throughput of base. Uh, but it'll be interesting once that's like production ready and and how the that changes this view of client diversity, right? If you have one much better client, so I, I like the approach of like having the primary client and then the backup client, but then you get into like, if you're running two clients at the same time, what does that do to your hardware requirements? So it is an interesting debate. And since Solana has an in, a history of having uh, outages, it's almost like lean into that. And like, that's what we're going to be this. We're going to maximize speed and at all costs kind of thing. All right, let's take a quick break to talk about Helium Mobile. Every month I'm reminded of the pain of a phone bill for someone who is terminally online. Those data charges are no joke. Well, Helium Mobile is bringing a crypto native solution to this. It's powered by a combination of a decentralized wireless network and the nation's largest 5G network to bring reliable coverage to its users. The coolest part for me are definitely the mobile token rewards. They're earned by sharing a location, which allows more people to build coverage where it's needed most. So effectively, the token rewards end up bringing a better product to the customer. But even cooler, you can take these rewards and pay for your phone bill directly within the app. This is a beautiful showcase of arguably crypto's two strongest use cases, incentivized user action and crypto payment rails. The phone plan is unlimited talk, text, and data, plus it's affordable at just $20 a month. If this sounds interesting to you, go to hellohelium.com to get three free months of service with the code LIGHTSPEEDMOBILE. Again, that's LIGHTSPEEDMOBILE, all caps, no spaces. Be sure to check out the link in the show notes for easy access. All right, guys, let's get back to the show. On the QoS side, so one of the interesting points that I think Tolly has talked a ton about is, you know, the validators don't necessarily need to be profitable. You can run, if you have a very successful business that happens to, you know, be doing some service on chain, uh, then you can run a validator as an operating cost, right? That's just a, a line item on your income statement and you'd still be very interested in doing it, right? If I'm making a billion dollars a year doing, providing some service or creating some good, um, and it costs me, you know, let's just make up a number, 100K a year to run a, a Solana validator. 
then I'm very happy to take that loss. That's that's just a casual uh, and everyday business operation. And so with the QoS stuff, I feel like that goes hand in hand. So it doesn't surprise me that you mentioned uh, he's he's a fan of the QoS stuff, right? If if there is a, if I get better service from the chain that my business is built on by having a validator and it accruing stake, uh, that kind of like goes hand in hand with the vision that he has there of of validators being more than just like this profit mechanism uh, and actually like providing a service to a business. Yeah, and it it is there's kind of a double whammy there because not only do you get more, let's say quality of connection, the more stake you have, you also make more money from the validator, the more Mm. stake you have. Right. And especially now, I I think like Solana validator profitability, at least from the validators I've talked to has been much better than in the past due to the increase in fees that the network is uh, generating. Now it is generating those relatively falsely, I would say, because people are, are overpaying for the fees, but, you can kind of at least gauge the market demand, right? Even if it's not technically necessary. I could also argue that Ethereum's fees are not necessarily need to be that high, right? If you made the runtime a bit more efficient, maybe those fees would be better off. Uh, uh, they'd be more isolated so that everybody doesn't need to afford the same cost for this unrelated state. Um, so it, yeah, it is super interesting. The, the QoS stuff, I mean, this is kind of like the interesting problems you start running into when you have continuous block building as opposed to the discrete approach that pretty much everybody else has taken, right? Because the continuous at its end game allows the ultimate result in performance, like the lowest possible latency. Things are just flowing, right? Um, and, you know, assuming that Tolly's original vision holds true in some, you know, sense of, of, of in some grand time scheme of, of NASDAQ on chain, um, that's going to be important. Um, but it's a very, very difficult thing to accomplish, which is particularly why I get like quite angry when people are like talking uh, about like, oh, like your chain doesn't even work. It's like, you know, this, like, this is a radically different approach than anybody else has taken. And it's not good for everybody that this is being pursued right now because it teaches everybody so many things. Like maybe Monad will take some of this or maybe another L1 will, right? Maybe Ethereum will at some point. And it's like, if you wanted the if you wanted to maximize the probability of success for the crypto industry as a whole, why would you not want these different paths to be taken and cover the most services you can, right? And so I think it's super difficult. And so it's very easy to dunk on for Twitter, but it's also like very important that we do this. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, especially in crypto, uh, maybe we can go into margin fine now, but like, I think this is like a good segue of like, <laughs> You, whatever you do, you will get absolutely <laughs> crucified. Like you, you, you will be crucified by everybody on the internet. And uh, th- there, there's um, people kind of take that for granted, but like it's it, it's it's pretty bad. Um, I'll let you kind of maybe give give a recap of the situation. Um, and but yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, people will will come at you uh, for for anything you do, good or bad. That just. I don't know. I think a byproduct of that is this industry running pretty heavily on Twitter and Twitter just kind of being, it's not like a to- toxic place by nature, but it has very toxic qualities to it. I'll, I'll kind of frame it that way, let's say. But uh, Margin Fi. So yeah, they've had an interesting history and uh, this kind of came to a boiling over point with one of the co-founders leaving the project as of yesterday. Um, seems like he formally has left the the project said you know something to the effect of I'm walking away I you know the lawyers are kind of figuring things out uh, but I'm not interested in taking any of my like tokens or, or equity package or any of that with me like I just kind of want to walk away and that be that and so how we got here is you know they've been building for around a year or so now um, and they're building a lending market on Solana and it's becoming, it was becoming one of the top projects in this space and, and kind of like this promising uh, rebirth of Solana DeFi alongside uh, the folks like Jito. And they started a points program in July of last year. So about nine months, so nine months and one week probably uh, ago. It's been and that long? Yeah. It's, so to be fair, it, you know, that's, this is, you can kind of start to resonate a bit with the community because they are, they're in, they're in an uproar about this. Uh, they've been farming for, for nine months in, when you're farming points here, you're, you're not guaranteed a token, but that is the, that is like what you expect. 
um, as the user. You're, on the other end of that, if I'm depositing and you're racking me up this number that says points in the top right corner, I'm expecting a reward for that. Uh, and yes, so it has been. It's, this. <laughs> it's been about nine months, and um, the they've had some like interesting run-ins with the community over the token, right? The, uh, the team has kind of been like rage baiting or mocking to to some degree and kind of been like they're like they're aware they've been running this very long points program. Uh, but I will say I do not envy being a U.S. resident and having the pressure of launching a token. You know, there's some Uniswap news we'll get into after this, but that that is not a fun position to be in. However, there are plenty of teams doing it. So there like there is precedent to do it, which if you were in this camp, they're like, hey, I don't think this is the right thing for me to do. And now it's additional pressure. So I do kind of sympathize with them. But um, at the same time, it's like, well, then why'd you run the points program? So TLDR here is MarginFi building a, a DeFi protocol, kicked off a points program for nine, nine months ago um, and has still not launched the token. And the the community who has been actively farming this thing for, for quite a while now is very upset. They, there's a bit of entitlement here, but there's also been like a, hey, guys, look, it's been nine months. Um, where, where is my, where's my token? Um, and now we've kind of reached this boiling over point where a co-founder has walked away and we kind of some question marks around what's next. They've seen over $200 million in outflows in the last 48 hours. Uh, so the users are kind of like, you know what, let it be, let that be that. And, uh, it's a little TBD on, on where we go from here, but I'm curious how you view this, this standpoint. Yeah, this is very... I mean, the TL, okay, uh, there's so many different views on this that I'm sure I'll get canceled regardless of what I say, but... Uh, that's that's yeah, kind of how I felt. Like, I feel like you yeah. defend either side here, you're going to have the, the opposite side pissed at you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, like, so they were one of the first ones. I don't think they were the first one, but they were one of the first to launch points. And I think this was somewhat before, like, you, if you launch points, you have to release a token. Like I, I do think that they launched that to point stuff pretty much before most people, such that the expectations weren't quite what they are today. Like in in the last two months, if you did points, you're launching a token. Like that's kind of expected. But I think there's some argument to be made that since they were so early, it's like, is that the case? Now I I don't have a doubt that they wanted to release a token, right? They're a borrow land protocol. They want to be decentralized. This is obvious. If you also look at Edgar's replies, um. I saw one of the comments was something like the token hasn't been released. I'm paraphrasing here because of lack of execution along the organizational side. So it seems like reading between the lines here. And he also commented in his resignation post about internal disagreements. So it does seem like there is some internal disagreements. Now, if that's within the co-founders, if that's within the investors and the founders, I don't know. Right. Like it's some something is wrong or some there were some disagreements there that the CEO of the company couldn't get uh, clearance for. Generally, if the CEO can't get that, that means it's actually quite uh, it, it's probably going to be an investor like cap table thing or the other co-founder has some kind of uh, disagreements with that. Um, and like some people will say, like, oh, well, you're a CEO. Why not, why not just like use your power and, and do this? And it's like, that's not how it works, right? If, if you do something where the entire team just hates you, that, that's not going to function. You're going to botch everything. Um, and, and so, and by the way, you might not have a legal right either. Um, so like the, the one thing I want to point out is it, there was clearly some internal stuff that didn't work out that nobody here knows of, right? We're, we're all just saying, we're, basically the community and let's say our point of view is, okay, there's margin finance. They have Mac, who is very, very aggressive on Twitter, not on like me. And then we have Edgar, who's also spicy on Twitter, maybe not as aggressive, but he's he's spicy. Um, and then you have a community that wants a token, and then you have these interactions between community and founders. Um, and it also doesn't help that there's other protocols that are trying to launch a token, like uh, like like a, like a you know Solan and Camino. Um, so it's actually kind of an adversarial environment. Um, and then, so I think the catalyst here was um, Soulblaze, which is um, a validator on Solana and also has their own liquid stake and token. I, I think it's called B-Soul, Blaze Soul. Um, they made like a post about uh, margins practices for how they interact with the Soulblaze. And it instantly got like a lot of likes, I think like 700 likes or something. Um, and 
you know, my guess to what happened is Edgar Price saw that and was like, okay, why is everybody already siding with this person before they even know our side of this? That seems a bit like like bullshit, like we didn't even do this, et cetera. And then he probably just, I don't know, he probably just broke down after that, which I can kind of relate to, right? Now, the shitty thing about Twitter is if you break down, it is public, okay? If, 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 you, if you're having a breakdown or – I'm not going to say he was having a breakdown. It just seemed like it to me. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, but, like, his responses did not seem like him normally. And so – so in Twitter, though, you, once you have that, people are taking screenshots of you, trying to dunk on you. The dunks are getting amplified in group chats, which are then getting posted to inverse bra or, or, or all possible channels. Your investors are seeing it. Your mom's probably seeing it. And it just keeps cascading on top of that. I mean, I know I saw it in my group chats, right? And that's just a lot of pre- pressure. And, and so, you know, I can see how a founder with the pressures of legal regulation – plus disagreement, plus community dis- dissent, uh, dissent, plus Twitter dunking all combine to just, you know, lead to uh, him resigning in a sense or just being like, okay, this is not really worth the health downsides. And so, you know, the one thing I'll say, I mean, and I did say this on the tweet is like, you know, if people want to criticize the business and the business decisions and the team and the execution, go ahead, right? That's totally fair game. Um, could they have done it better? Of course, obviously, right? Um, the, the one thing I, I wasn't a fan of is kind of dunking on a person who is like publicly having a meltdown, right? Like th- that person is already, uh, going through some shit. Okay. Like there's no, nothing to be gained by just shitting on. And that's coming from me. Like I love dunking on people, but like the, even th- like, this is just, I, I think there's like a limit. Um, and, um, what I'm interested actually now, because Margin, the Twitter account, and Mac, et cetera, did um, announce that it's they still care about the users. They're gonna they have new products coming out, et cetera, et cetera. So it seems like they're actually not going away anywhere. It seems like Edgar resigned. So I'm very interested to see what happens because usually when a CEO leaves, the company is not quite the same. But then there are exceptions. Obviously, I'm not. I want to give the you know the example of like Microsoft because that's a totally different ball game. But like. Purely from an organizational perspective, there are cases when the CEO leaves and another one joins, the company could still be just as good, if not better. So I'm super interested to see what happens with that, especially because they have a strong cap table with like multi-coin. You bring up great points around, you know, being people just being like, oh, you're the CEO, you can do anything. Like, yeah, it's just not quite how the world works, uh, my friend. That's, uh, I wish it was, but that's not the case. Um and agree with you on on the the dunking on the people stuff, right? That there's a difference between like you know sh- getting in a zinger and just being a dick. Like they're two very different things. So, uh, but that's kind of the downside of Twitter, right? People can just sit behind a keyboard and yap away, and there's like no repercussions to doing so. So you're gonna, I mean, that's inevitable, right? We just had this meme coin escapade not too long ago on Solana where people were putting you know very profanative things on, on meme coins, right? That's just like, it's what people do. People suck as the TLDR there. Uh, but it's interesting to even see the competition kind of getting in on the action, right? Uh, so MarginFi is a, a lending protocol and there's other lending protocols on Solana. Notably, Solend and Camino have been doing well. Um, I, Solend specifically, they put out a, a couple tweets here. Solend will airdrop to users who withdraw from MarginFi and deposit into Solend. The airdrop will be pr- proportional to the dollar value migrated over. Funds have to stay deposited for a period of time to qualify. More details to be shared soon. Uh, which is interesting, right? Now you're seeing like these vampire attacks kind of come in because it was a hot ball of capital there actively farming. And so opportunity uh, is is abound for some of these competitors. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I believe Ruder even quote tweeted like vampire side. Like he, he's just being very upfront about it. They had a lot uh, of beef though, to be fair. They were like, even going back to the uh, <laughs> LST oracles and, and debate there that happened. I, we actually had both of the both teams on for a podcast on, on Lightspeed, I believe. Yep. We had Ruder and Edgar on for a small little debate. Um, and I like both guys. Uh, good teams. Disclaimer, I'm an investor in Sweeland, the Sui version of Solend. Um and yeah, I mean, I, personally, I, I think stuff like that is super fun, right? Like literally vampire attacking in, in, in public. I think that's like takes it's because um, like that's kind of, you know, it's 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 um, it's not inherently offside. I don't think I think it's a little on the edge, which I think is what makes it interesting. Um, but but, you know, the one thing also um, this kind of just reminds me, I've seen two different cases of this this week. 
One was um, there was this guy retired Chad Dev or something. I I think that's his actual name. I, I'm, he probably changed that name, man. I really don't like saying that. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> and uh, I think he was um, farming like the tensor airdrop or something, and he wasn't like happy with um, the input given by the team or the instructions given by the team to what he actually received. And then Rex, who's R89 on Twitter, started like insulting the hell out of him and they started going back and forth. And uh, so that, that was a big thing. And then I also saw today um, the Tensorian uh, NFT prices kind of go down like a lot. And a lot of also, um, you know, people calling them like names and stuff, the founders, and um, it just reminded me of this tweet that I made um, a, a few months ago now, which is like, and I got some heat for this, but basically it was something like, I can't believe the industry decided to bribe people to pretend to use their stuff and, and thinks this is a good strategy for PMF. And this is why I said this, right? Because you are paying people in a sense, a lot of money to basically beta test your products. Okay, you're not even really uh, tuning it to help you with like PMF or something. It's really, it seems like to me to test your product in a sense, right? Because that's how the incentives have been lined up. Like you just, people are using it or they're pretending to use it. They get some reward for it. They expect to get some reward for it, which is the important part. And then when they don't get the exact reward that they think they would have gotten, which is going to happen to everybody, they get mad at you. And now your brand actually has a worse reputation. Um, so I, I think that everybody who's done this has done it. Um, I disagree with how they've done it personally. Uh, I haven't done it myself, so I'm not, I'm not anyone to say I could do better. Um, but I think for example, Jito did it really well. Uh, like in, and, and by the way, I'm an investor in Jito and Tensor, but I, like, for example, Jito, I was just sticking with them cause I was like, I want MEV revenue, right? Like, why not? Um, and then they were like, we're doing an airdrop. I was like, oh, shit, that's awesome. And then now they're doing governance proposals. And I'm like, oh, actually, I have some. I'm, I'm now interested in, in seeing if I can make an impact here. So that – and th there was no like, I'm only doing this to farm a few – like it's th – that that incentive just seems super broken to me. That's not to say airdrops are bad or that incentives are bad. It's that I think the execution of them currently has been too – um let's say unoriginal. Okay. I think they've been way too like, it's almost like there's a playbook. Like you just say, Hey, we're going to do points, expect to get tokens, farm it this way in multiple seasons. And then afterwards we'll give you something. Okay. Well, what happens after that? Okay. Hopefully the beta testers gave you something that now you can use to get additional PMF and get more users. Cause if you didn't, you're kind of done. Um, or at least you are very, handicapped against others who can also now do the same thing to you. Um, so, you know, if you're a founder, you really need to, uh, and I say this, by the way, there's other airdrops coming, right? I think there's parcel coming pretty soon. Zeta is coming soon. I believe drift will come at some point since they announced points a while ago. Um, and match Eden seems like they'll be doing one. um, I think those are the ones I can think of. I'm sure there's more that I forgot, but um should be interesting. And now there's almost this precedent set that if you do points and you don't do a token, like outrage will, will happen, right? We, we just got to see this live with um, with MarginFi. And I don't know, you, you, you bring up good points there as well, though. Like on the Tensor note, you know, people were like upset that the NFT didn't get the airdrop that they wanted. Right. And so you just like, if you pull up the tensor price, the tensorian price chart, uh, you can kind of see the anger reflected there. <laughs> but the, like the other thing is, this is where the entitlement thing comes into me because like you're doing you're you're, you know what you're doing, right? <laughs> if you're just like, Okay, if we're using Tensor as an example, if you're just picking a random NFT and trying to like market make a, a small, you know, hundred dollar, uh, bit ask there like you you know you're farming you're not doing that because you want to make this market um and so if you don't get the reward you want you just gotta like to me when i when it happens to me i'm like ah oh, damn that 
I could have used my time better back to the drawing board. Like that, I don't know. When you just start demanding more money for free is is interesting. I, I don't quite get it. Because crypto has a super powerful engine of having a really easy way with tokens to incentivize user action. And that's a very broad statement, but you can do interesting things. You mentioned GDOs. Uh, I think part of the reason why that one was so successful is they gave 10,000 people a new car. Uh, so that's, that's kind of hard to not be upset about. Um, but they had a very specific action, which is growing the size of GDO soul, right? The amount of deposits um, to grow their, their share of the network stake. And they incentivized users with, hey, if you do this, we will reward you. Um, the question is, how do you do that on an ongoing basis? That's the challenge. Because on a, if you look at like a percentage basis of, per, basis of token distribution, if your airdrop is 60% of your total supply, all right, well, now you've only got 40% of your supply for the rest of time being. Your, your community now owns 60% of your token, and you've kind of like shot your shot. Uh, but if you say, make that 5%, and then you do like another 55% in uh, ongoing rewards, you have the same amount of rewards, but spread over a longer time horizon where, you know, today your action might be one thing that you need to incentivize, but in a year or two, it could be a totally different action. Um, so I don't know. I, I, I find like, I love airdrops. Who doesn't? It's free money. But if I'm like looking at it from the other side of the the table, being like the company or the, the protocol, you know, I'm giving away... Uh, some governance rights or some form of ownership or revenue share, depending on the protocol. Uh, I'm giving away this, the, this, these rights to my users, which is powerful. But like, if you make like a map to tradi the traditional world, which isn't perfect, and like tokens aren't equity today, like there needs to be a legal uh, world around this that isn't there. But if you just made this analogy, and again, and out reasoning through analogies is, is never the best, but let's just bear with it. Um, if like you view the tokens as the equity and the protocol as the company, like you're, you're selling your equity for action and like, is that a good idea? Is that a bad idea? It's kind of like TBD. Um, the other cool thing that you mentioned was, is the vampire tax being like edgy and fun. And like, the reason why I think that I would agree with you is they don't always work. So it's not just like this, you know, uh, silver bullet that you can shoot and like you kill the other protocol, like sushi swap, Uniswap, sushi swap, tried to attack Uniswap, failed miserably. Um, Uniswap is a kingmaker today. It's mm -hmm. probably a good segue, actually, to jump into the Uniswap news. So, um, Uniswap was has received a Wells notice from the SEC, and a, a quick one too on what a Wells notice is. It's a formal communication from the SEC notifying the recipient that the SEC staff intends to recommend enforcement action against them. Uh, so this basically gives the recipient the opportunity to respond to the allegations the SEC is bringing forth to them, uh, kind of pre present their case, and you know make a make a decision on what this what the enforcement plan will be uh, going forward, and so. Like, I think if you were like a traditional company and you got this Wells notice, you'd cease operations and then basically come up with a plan to present your case to the SEC. And then you'd go from there. Uh, but granted that Uniswap has deployed these contracts onto Ethereum mainnet uh, and other chains, but let's zoom in on Ethereum here. Uh, there is no like killing them or, or turning them off, right? Like these are effectively run by the Ethereum validators. Every time a new block gets produced, there's Uniswap trades in it. Like, like Uniswap labs cannot stop these contracts. Uh, Hayden put out a tweet that uh, it was a pretty long tweet. I recommend everyone reading it. Uh, just granted, the industry is really rallying behind them now. But part of this tweet was, I'm confident in the products we offer are legal and that our work is on the right side of history. But it's been clear for a while that rather than working to create clear, informed rules, the SEC has decided to focus on attacking longtime good actors like Uniswap and Coinbase, all while letting bad actors like FTX slip by. I think he has a great point here. There are layup scams in, in this industry and going after Coinbase and Uniswap is just going straight for like these people who are trying to do the right thing. Um, and that seems weird to me on two notes. One is like the moral side of that of like, dude, like there's actually people getting rugged and le convicted criminals running scams using crypto. Like let's go after those people. That That's, that's like the moral right thing to do. But also from a, if you were the SEC and you really just like hated this shit and you wanted to take down crypto, uh, that is also where I would start, right? I'd go after these these obvious scams, put them in, you know, get enforcement action against them, create precedent that what they're doing was illegal, and then go after the big guns. Now that I have like these these court like or what is treated as precedent in court, um, 
So it doesn't really make much sense to me that they they went straight for the big guns. Which I, I don't know. So I think the, the one point where I might disagree is if I were the SEC, I would go for the obvious games first. Uh, if I were to maybe steel man their perspective, what I assume to be their perspective, I don't actually have, I have no idea. They're very bad communicators. Um, probably it's something like, I think I'm right. I, I think crypto is bad and I think they need to obey by my rules. Therefore, I'm going to go after the two biggest first, make an example out of them, and then everybody else will be too scared to do anything. That's probably what they're thinking is my guess. I mean, what else could they possibly be thinking? Like, hey, we're not going to lose. We're not going to win this anyway, so let's scratch for the best ones. Seems like it would be, or at least maybe their thing is more like, let's just drag this out for many years such that we can say we made somewhat of an impact. Um, now, of course, the th problem with this is I don't think they've done the work required to have a meaningful opinion. Okay. I don't think they've studied the crypto industry well enough to understand what we're actually doing here. And we're actually most of our, I don't want to say most of us actually, but a very fair chunk of the founders and teams and startups uh, are here to actually improve the existing systems and not to make a few bucks from a scam and just do that ad infinitum. Okay. Um, so I think like crypto, it's, I think there's like the, and maybe this is orthogonal, but there's actually like, Crypto has a pretty large image problem, I would say. Like every time you see it on TV, it's somebody using Bitcoin for ransom. <laughs> like that's kind of the public perception of uh, crypto, um, which is not great. Like we talk about this stuff, like Solana and L2s and stuff. Nobody has any idea what this stuff is. Okay. <laughs> like all they know is there are these coins that go up and down in price. I can make money using them. They're also brought up a lot in scams on TV. <laughs> like that's their mental model. So that's 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 bad. Um, and so shout out to Coinbase for helping with uh, some of the marketing material to actually improve that. Certainly need more of that. Um, but I think the much more interesting part of this is you are not going to stop crypto by suing USA companies, right? All you're going to do is... Uh, slow down the progress that USA founders uh, uh, have 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 to make in crypto, okay? You are just going to hurt the US is maybe a more succinct way of putting this because the US is founded on being risk takers, entrepreneurs, founders, right? The culture itself is risk taking, right? Like you're encouraged to do this. This is not the case. Many people don't know this. This is absolutely the opposite of the case in most countries where you have to go to school in a certain place. If you try to start a business and fail, people just laugh at you and you're shunned from society. This is more common in the Eastern cultures. Okay. In the West, that is not the case. In the West, you keep starting companies. Just, just do it until you succeed, basically. Right? Like Silicon Valley, that ethos. Um, and so now what you're saying is, actually, let's actually give the East a chance to catch up here so that they can be the ones to take risk and start these companies and the governments actually work with them to build these new things that actually improve systems. Because at the end of the day, technology is not about zero sum, about like taking somebody's value and then transferring it to yourself. It's about creating new value, right? Entrepreneurs, at the end of the day, create value for everybody else that benefit from you know what they've built and they capture some percent of that, right? That's a very common saying in like Silicon Valley, which is like, like wealth is inherently positive. Some you create it. It's not finite. Um, and the U.S. just seems to uh, take a very. And by the way, it doesn't seem like it's everybody in the U.S. to be fair, right? Like like uh, SEC commissioner, uh, one, one of them, Hester, I, I believe. I, I forget her. Yeah, name. Hester Pierce. Yeah. Like she seems very uh, anti-Gensler and, and pro-crypto. A lot of people. Um, Actually, I'm not going to say a lot, but a fair number of people also seem to think this way in the U.S. Um, and, and so I guess my thoughts can be summed up as doing this will not hurt crypto, really. It will hurt the USA. Um, and I am interested to see what the dynamics are there. It's impossible to reason about these things in my view because of the sheer number of nonlinearities present. Um, but it does seem like the one safe thing that you can take away from it is that if this keeps up, Innovation in the USA is going to slow down relative to other places, which doesn't sound great.
Yeah, it's a shame. Uh, I think it was Banteg, one of the the Yearn devs, put out a chart that was like the U.S.'s involvement uh, with crypto de- or the percentage of crypto developers that were in the U.S. And it was like uh, they took like two samples. I don't, I forget the exact dates. So let's say it was like twenty fifteen and er, twenty like eighteen and twenty twenty two or something of that nature. Uh, and it was like a, a substantial decrease. And like if you created like a linear projection based off those two points. It's like by 2035, that, that, that will be zero. And quite honestly, it feels like we're on that pace, which is a shame uh, as somebody who lives in the U.S. and uh, enjoys this country. Uh, it is like we, you know, we would want to, I'd want to see us like path leading the path here uh, instead of kind of trailing behind the pack. Yeah. And one of the things that interests or is it interesting to look at or reason about is, in my experience at least, when I go to like a DeFi website that I haven't been to before, It'll give you like a disclaimer. And the list of countries is like Iran, North Korea, like Egypt, Cuba, and then it's the USA. And I'm like, okay, one of these is quite clearly not company you want to be in. Uh, And so like if that doesn't make you rethink something that's off about the regulation, I'm not sure what will, honestly, because that's like very clear. Um, Like I think Europe is known for, at least Northern Europe is known for relatively draconian laws even they have a more friendly attitude. <laughs> like, I'm just very confused. Um, but, and then now the issue becomes political, right? Because like some of the candidates have expressed, at least in their revealed preferences, like, for example, Trump has like a, what, like a NFT collection on Polygon or something. Like, that's pretty hilarious, I think. And then like his wife, uh, Melania, has one on Solana and Polygon. Uh, meanwhile, they're trying to ban every single one on the other part of it. So I wonder, like, I don't think there's any signal there, but it is interesting to reason about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you're completely right on it getting politicized. Even if not quite at the candidate level, it seems like even everybody in the space is like, I don't know, uh, Jason Yanowitz put out a tweet yesterday about uh, about crypto and somebody respond like, who'd you vote for? And it was like already the political angle. It was actually Martin Screlly who responded. But other exciting news to move on to is fast chains are good. Fast chains are good. Monad raised at a, they ra- I don't know what they raised at, but they raised $225 million led by Paradigm. Uh, I'm sure Paradigm put in a large portion of that 225 million But it's really interesting. Monad is built around optimizing the EVM. They want to to fix what was wrong with it, uh, which is its inability to reach high throughput, largely due to state growth. Uh, and that's really over summarizing there. They've also added uh, um, parallel execution at the client, le- uh, the, the execution layer, and they've tweaked the, uh, the consensus mechanism as well. So interesting to see this come live. It's got a lot of attention. They've absolutely crushed branding. They've had key partnerships with uh, other protocols launching tokens like uh, Wormhole, for example. So like Manad, Discord users got a portion of that. They've built a pretty strong community. Their branding is is crushing. I, I think they're using the the new Delphi Labs arm to do some of that marketing and like all the content they're pushing out is, is really good. Um, and ultimately the question is, is their product going to be that good? And you know, if it's what it says it is, Feels like it's a better Ethereum. I don't know if that's a hot take at all, but like, I, and I also don't know what the validator hardware requirements are going to look like personally. Um, so I'm curious how you like when you look at Monad and, and what it's doing. Like, does that get you excited? If you were Ethereum, would you be nervous? Like, how do you how do you gauge this? Sure. Yeah. Um, so first, I'm a I'm an investor. So just, um. But by the way, one thing I want to like, I get this a lot, which is like, oh, you say this because you're an investor is like this common way of thinking on Twitter. But it's actually the total opposite way. It's like I'm an investor because I like to think to begin with. Right. Otherwise, I wouldn't spend my money on it. (laughs) Right. Like uh, so that's I think the causality there is generally quite backwards. Um, Okay. uh, now to the actual things. So one is I don't think it's a better Ethereum because I think Ethereum has changed so much at the base there that they're not even trying to be like an L1 or at least, I mean, certainly not an integrated L1. They're like a semi-modular L1 in a sense, like where they have specific things on the L1 only to support rollups. And so it's like, okay, they're not going to scale to L1. They've kind of, it seems like they're basically, I mean, with the exception of maybe raising gas limits some X amount of periods, it seems like they're kind of done there. And 
one of the things I really didn't like was Vitalik's latest blog, or not latest, but one of the latest blog posts was something like we're on the declining end of the, or the accelerating tr- end of the S curve, such that he doesn't expect many large things to happen on the L1 anymore. And that is offloaded to the L2s. Okay. That is just what they've done. I'm not going to judge that. But so that's why I think it's maybe not, I can't really reason about Monad by comparing it to Ethereum in that sense. Um, But yeah, so like everybody on Twitter, at least, seems to be focusing on the parallel EVM side uh, and saying like, this is the thing that's going to really crush everything out of the water. uh, And then you will get the very fair responses that the EVM is actually not as bad as people say it is. You can only do so many things with parallelization, et cetera, et cetera. And I actually agree with maybe the latter camp. I actually don't think paralyzing the EVM, it's obviously a big bonus that it's going to be better than not having it. But I don't think that's like the one thing that you just add and then now, boom. Okay. It has to be in a system. A system is comprised of many parts. All the parts need to be tuned in line relative to each other to achieve that smooth performance, right? Like in a car, if you have a really the best engine possible, but then you have like bicycle tires, it's not going to go very far. Okay. You, the entire car needs to be built with performance in mind. And that's what I like about Monad, which is that one, they like the idea of scaling at the L1, which I strongly believe in. Um, the TLDR, why I believe in it without getting too long is because I think crypto is still super early And it makes much more sense to optimize at the lowest level possible because you can always stack layers on top of that later on, but you only really get to do the L1 once in a risk-free way. After that, it becomes super risky. So if crypto is going to be around for a thousand years, this is day one. Okay. And so why not optimize now? Um, The things that you can optimize. And um, so the thing I like about that is um, the ethos of building the L1 for performance in mind the parallel EVM is just an implementation detail of that and really is probably just a go-to-market strategy more than anything to get people who already have applications that are written with compatible stacks to build on top of them, right? Because Solana has that problem where it's like somebody will want to build on Solana, right? I'm, a, I'm an infra provider on Solana. And I'm like, mm, you can't really use the EVM tools that we have today. You're probably going to need to rewrite this if you want the best performance possible. And so we probably lost hundreds of teams to that alone. Now, we've also gained some teams to do that, but Solana already fills that gap. Okay, so now Mon I can come in and be like, okay, we're super performance, but also you can pour your application here. So that's a good GTM flywheel. Like it's a good inertial, uh, uh, it's a good weight to overcome inertia. And so that's how I think of it. But uh, it for its own self is not that impressive um, in, in, in the grand scheme of things. But then they have other things, right? They have they have different. Uh, they they resend the databases, for example. Um, it's unclear, obviously, some of the like the requirements and stuff what that looks like. But the thing I like is the ethos of performance with being uh, number one. And then obviously the other thing they've done really well is the go to market and the community and the branding aspects, right? The 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 one thing that I think almost all L ones except for Solana new L1s, except for Solana, have gotten wrong, or not wrong, but maybe not optimal, is this corporate approach to partnerships and building a developer ecosystem. It's very top-down, right? Like, we're going to give you money. You're going to come to our chain. We're going to run out of money. You're going to go to another chain, right? That's kind of been the strategy. Whereas Monad is like, actually, we're going to first do the evangelizing of individual parties from the bottom up, they're going to emanate some sort of values. Other people will see those values, come join them, and then we will kind of start spreading that way. And they've done a good job of that. They have, I mean, they, they have like a few like full-time meme guys, right? Like that's how you know they're serious. If you have full-time meme guys before the product is launched, you're serious about community. And that's underrated. And I think most people, like a Sui and, Mon, uh, Sui and Aptos, I don't think they can even relate to that. Because it's so foreign to them, right? They've spent their lives at Facebook. Um, they've learned great engineering, but maybe they're not as familiar with the DGen community nature of crypto from the ground, right? Whereas the Monad guys are. That's an edge. And so you combine those two things, 
and you can kind of see this in their round, right? They, I mean, they included like <laughs> pretty much the entire app uh, and, and the cap table. And uh, you, you can see that that's what interests me there, right? Uh, I always think I tweeted this during um, what, the, the reason the Polygon Solana like war things started on Twitter um, was um, a, a few years ago, I commented uh, after they made the Starbucks deal. I was like, Polygon pays people to use their chain and they're not upcoming about it or front coming about it uh, or forthcoming about it. And then, but Solana gets paid to for people to use their chain. And then I made like a post of like funding and, and whatnot. And then Sandy commented, Ryan commented, the co-founders all blocked me, <laughs> et cetera. And then it went like pretty viral. Um, and uh, that's kind of like the start of that. But it turns out it was actually kind of correct because Polygon now, um, n- not most of those deals are standing, right? The Starbucks one isn't standing. The FanDuel thing turned out that they're paying for them, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I don't think it's like an inherently bad thing. Uh, and I think Polygon, by the way, has changed a lot since then. So like, I'm actually a, for a sure. pretty big fan of them at this point. But at that time, I think people weren't agreeing that that was a good thing to do, uh, like bottom-up brand building, which was what Solana did with like hacker houses and, and kind of like the pit vipers and like the memes and stuff. But I do think it is the more um, in-demand thing from the market, which is generally people that resonate more with that. Yeah, on the on the first point about you know parallel execution probably not being the biggest unlock for Minad in in the EVM in general is it, pretty interesting. But I think why, like again, it, it comes to how you sell yourself and sell your story, and people understand what execution is because they process transactions so that like conceptually makes sense, very easy to digest in a head of hey, I send transaction, blockchain executes transaction, I'm happy, very simple. And then everybody knows what parallel means. So now I'm doing it at the same time. Cool, awesome, faster. And and I think that is like, so basically when you say parallel processing to someone, they're like, oh, that means it goes faster. And be like, yeah, but we also had to like, you know, rewrite our DB and we also had to like tweak consensus. But hey, like that's, everyone's like, ah, whatever. Like, especially on the DB side of things. I know Avalanche um, is releasing Firewood here pretty soon and are some benchmarks on Firewood. Uh, and they've like, re- this is the second time they've rewritten the d- database uh, and that's because like they can juice performance by by doing so. But like when you're reading through like what they're doing, who like that you gotta be you gotta be ready to to take a couple walks in between. Which quite frankly, that's how I feel about a lot of the Solana networking stuff. Like I am not a networking engineer, um, so it, it, I don't know. It's like lear- it's fun to like learn high level of what's going on. But like if you really want to take it ten steps deeper, it's yeah you gotta be like a, a true networking engineer. Um, but not to go too far out of line here, I think what you mentioned about the community focus is super important because the users of today are very much that DGen on-chain crowd. Um, and like they like the memes. That, like, that's the people that are here today. Um, but when, so like, there's two reasons why you wouldn't like, spend a lot of time onboarding that crew is A, you were just blind to it and like, weren't aware that was the case, which is certainly possible. But B would be like you're more focused about onboarding the next wave or generation of users who you think won't be that that style of person. Um, it's probably more so the former for a lot of teams and just like not spending time talking to their customers. I, I, I know you're loud about that. And I think it really is a problem of what people do is just like, go build this thing. And if I, if I build it, they will come. But again, going to telling your story and selling yourself, that's like critically important. Uh, you mentioned SWE there as well, and they actually just had a, an interesting announcement here to close us out. Is they're building like a, a handheld gaming device, very similar uh, to the the idea behind the Solana Saga phone. Is like, hey, if we get this device that is in some way, shape, or form connected to the our chain, you know, where that's how you bring users on chain is is put the device in their hands. Smartphones are like everybody's lifeline today. You take someone's phone away, drop them in a city. I mean, good luck to the average person. Um, and so the Saga phone makes a ton of sense to me. And I think Sui's taking a pretty similar look at that and saying, hey, we want to, we know we want to lean into gaming. And this device angle is super, super interesting. That is how people interact with games. Uh, I know uh, David on Effort Capital from uh, the Blockworks research team, uh, we, he, he's our in-house boomer. Uh, he, he cracked over 30, so he's the in-house boomer. And... Uh, he always says, like, if you're building a, a like an on-chain game and it's on the desktop, he's like, forget about it. What are you doing? Like, everybody is on mobile. No, I, it's like you you want me to go sit down in front of my computer, in front of my wife and kid, and play 
an, a desktop game, not happening. He's like, I, I'm not a loser. I'm not doing that, man. Of course, <laughs> me, like I like gaming, so that's totally normal to me. But um, I, I find it super interesting from his viewpoint of like, yeah, dude, you give me a device, I'll play that shit all day, uh, which is true. Like everyone, we grew up with like Game Boys and PSPs and uh, Nintendo DS, now the Nintendo Switch. It's a pretty interesting angle. I'm curious to, to get your, your scope on the, this new Sui gaming device. Yeah, I I don't think this should surprise anybody, but I'm a huge fan of, of the move. I think it's a bold move, uh, but I think you need to take some of those. And this is a bold move. I mean, you know, hardware is difficult. You don't really make money on hardware uh, unless you have a really wild distribution effects like an Apple or it's very integrated with an in-house. Um, so uh, it's... It's a bold move. It's a risky move. And I love it. I think it's awesome. And I, I, I mean, I'll pick one up myself, for example. For sure. I, yeah. Um, I don't, you know, I've personally never been like a Nintendo Switch, PSP, Game Boy kind of guy. I like doing everything on one machine. So I, I, I do like PC gaming. Um, but um, I don't see why not. Like there's a huge market for that. And even I'm going to get one. I am curious to see exactly what the Sui integration will be like. Um, is it like only games that are on the Sui blockchain? Like, is it Sui like keys that you interact with for the device? Like, um, you know, I'm not sure what that exactly looks like, so I can't really comment on the technicals. But uh, the high level idea of you being a team trying to push crypto forward and you see an opportunity in the market, like gaming, and you go after it full force with something as risky as a device. And you announce it, and you have good materials be alongside it. I think that's great. Uh, so, and I think, yeah, like what, like you can't really make triple quad A games on devices. Like, you know, I mean, you can, but it's you're not Nintendo, right? Like those games are kind of a different breed. So, I think if you can just make like. Give me Flappy yeah, just, Bird. Just give me that like fun, addicting game that's yeah. like, yeah, I don't need like you know Legend of Zelda or something. But the granted, that's on like mobile is, or, or dedicated device. I, don't know, I guess you wouldn't really call that mobile, right? Like you can play Zelda on a Nintendo Switch, and it's like a good experience. Yeah. So I think like something like that, or like a Pokemon, like a stripped down version, because I know they have like their their sweet Pokemon things. Uh, I think that could be oh, cool, like a racing good. game, like a horse racing game. I don't know, like just earn some money or, or put some real stake into it. Uh, anyways, yeah, I'll pick one up. It seems awesome. Yeah. Solana went really wide, uh, with the, with the mobile phone, right. And displacing a user's everyday, like lifeline. That's, that's no small task. And I, I uh, got the privilege of like messing around with one, the editorial team at Blockworks got to, to demo one out uh, while I was in New York and it, it's slick. I, I enjoyed the experience, but there's a high bar for me to replace my iPhone. Like there just is, um, yeah. But the gaming devices is, is different, I think. Like you're, I think you're taking a risk on going really, really narrow on one vertical of gaming. But it's an easier one for me to be like, yeah, this will be my only gaming device. Like, why not? Like, I haven't touched my Switch in months. Like, I'd be more than happy to pick up a new, like, absolutely. Um, so that's pretty interesting. The probability of success, I think, is much higher for the Sui device than the Salon device, if I'm being honest. Um, again, yeah, because... There are entire armies dedicated to building the best phone you can get that compete within themselves with like Apple and Samsung. Unless you put those same armies there, it's going to be hard for you to compete. So there needs to be some sort of software edge there, which they do have, but like it's unclear how much of a moat that is. Um, but with gaming, I don't even have one right now. I don't have to replace anything. It's a new addition to my life or my routine that I can fuck around with. Maybe if I'm on a plane. Perfect, right. Yeah. Um, so it seems like the probably success for that. And obviously I'm a huge slonable, but I think Sui, that's a better move by them for that specific market. You said it again. That's a better move, pun intended. If you get that <laughs> joke, go touch some grass this weekend. It's probably a good place to call it. Uh, Mert, always a pleasure, man. And to the listeners, we will see you all next week. Cheers. Cheers.